So this question, it's trying to walk you through um, the um, walk you through the steps that you should be going through to once again to solve the setup. And uh, when we are vague like that, uh, solving the setup, then what it means is you should be able to break it down. You should be able to analyze it in such a way that any questions on something someone asks, like someone asks you for the acceleration or the tension, you should be able to, you know, relatively short set of steps. So, um, yeah. Okay, I guess we'll do all the parts here. It's, um, so uh, parts A and B, you did that in the lab, and C and D, it's, it would be fun thing to do. Um, you didn't do it in the lab, so it'll especially be fun thing to do. So, um, so it says draw free body diagrams. Uh, so I will draw free body diagrams. So, and really what the steps here are having you walk through is the standard strategy. And so, you know, it, the question doesn't ask you to write down standard strategy. And frankly, I probably won't ask you any question where I ask you to spell out standard strategy because it, you know, it is one of the methods. You don't necessarily have to follow it. But um, hopefully this is in the back of your head as you're going through this question. That the very first step is drawing free body diagram. And that's why that's what part A is asking. And in the second and third step, which will be very short for this question, you define coordinate axis. And mostly you pay attention to the direction of acceleration. That's what matters the most. Here, um, you are just uh, looking at it accelerating either completely horizontally or completely vertically. So that makes your uh, step number two a little bit easier. And step number three, which is not existent, existent here, is you break forces into uh, into components. But um, I guess this is more relevant for the next question. And once you are done through all these three steps, then you should have a free body diagram where you basically labeled everything. And all you need to do is copy over the information to write down Newton's second law equations. So with this in the back of your head, what you are going through is the very first step draw the free body diagrams for small mass M and the big mass M on the table. So uh, free body diagrams. And so um, the thing to remember with the free body diagrams is you draw separate diagrams for each object in your setup. Here there's two objects. So we draw two separate diagrams. And sometimes people do do this where people draw forces right on the pictures themselves and I guess that's technically not wrong, but I prefer to draw free body diagrams separately this way because it's meant to be a diagram of force only and I don't want to be confused by these strings and other things that uh, that's not force. So I have uh, these two dots representing each of the object and for each dot I'm just going through um, what are the forces on that object and each time I draw force I verify with myself if I drew all the forces. So for this uh, small hanging mass, well, I start out with the gravity. There's always going to be gravity pulling things down. Then I, I ask myself, did I draw all the forces? And I didn't because there's this top string that should be pulling things. So I need to draw tension. Then I ask, did I draw all the forces? And other than possibly friction, uh, but it says ignore any friction of forces. So I'm done with the hanging mass. For the big mass on the table there, um, I start out with the gravity once again. So there's gravitational force pulling it down. Then uh, I ask, as I ask myself, did I draw all the forces? What I'm really looking at is, does the direction of acceleration that seems to be implied by the forces I have drawn make sense? And here I know this mass is accelerating horizontally. So the forces I have doesn't make sense. There must be a normal force that's balancing out the gravity. Then I keep asking myself, did I draw all the forces? And oh, the one force I'm missing is the force coming from the tension here. So I need to draw tension force. All right, uh, so that 
seems to be um, all the forces, uh, just to be thorough, it says indicate any forces that are equal in magnitude. So I'm going to indicate this normal force and gravity are equal in magnitude. And I guess the thing I was trying to catch people is these two forces are not equal in magnitude. I was trying to draw them uh, different in size and it's because this mass should be accelerating downward and this mass should be accelerating to the left. And for this mass to be accelerating downward, the tension should be less than weight. I think we went over that in the lab. All right, so those are the free body diagrams and I indicated the direction of acceleration. So we are ready to move on. Uh, part B asks, says, find the acceleration of the two masses and the tension T in the string if the masses are free to move. So this is where uh, having this standard strategy in the back of your head is useful because then you will have seen you are done through steps one through three and what you are now doing is step number four. And so the you know, question doesn't ask you explicitly to write down Newton's second law equation, but that's what you need to write down in order to be able to solve for the acceleration and the tension. So writing that down. Uh, you should remember to write down uh, this equation uh, once for each object, once for each object, and once for each direction. So here, um, for each object here, technically I might be uh, writing down up to two equations. So potentially I could have been writing down four equations, but some of the directions here are very boring. So let's just start out with a small mass n. So when we are looking at the net force of a small mass n, uh, let's do the vertical direction first. Then I have, um, so I'm going to let the direction of acceleration be my positive direction. So it's mg minus t is equal to mass times acceleration. And technically, I might need to write down the net force on small mass m in the x direction, but there are no forces in the x direction here. So it's gonna be all just boring zero, zero, zero sign. Just not gonna bother with that and just move on to bigger mass m. So for the big mass m, um, even though nothing much happens in the vertical direction, I will write down something so that it's demonstrated. So, uh, the, so let's do the x direction first. So, so for the big mass m in the x direction, it's going to be a little bit unusual letting the left toward the direction be positive, but um, I'll, I'll just do it that way. If you somehow made the right toward the direction positive, then what you have to remember is you have to remember your acceleration is going in the negative direction. So rather than dealing with all that, I'm just going to say my um, left word is positive. Then I can say tension is going in the positive direction and that's equal to the big mass times the acceleration. And it's worth pausing for a bit and making sure that since I'm writing this in the equation that these two tensions are indeed equal to each other in magnitude. And hopefully you can convince yourself of that. And that these two accelerations are indeed the, the same magnitude of acceleration. If they are not, then this is the step where you need to make sure you are using different letters so that you don't confuse them. Uh, finally, for the y direction, net force for the big mass in the y direction, we have normal force minus mg, and that should equal zero since it's not accelerating in that direction. So this is the third and last equation. Um, I guess you would write it down if you are looking for the normal force somehow. But um, for our purposes, it doesn't add anything uh, useful. Really the first two equations give us everything we need. So we have equation one and two, two equations. And I always do this check, uh, counting my equations and counting my unknowns and make sure those two match. So I have two equations and two unknowns. So I have a system of equations that I know should be solvable. The reason for this check is really to not waste any time. Uh, the, the whole reason for this standard strategy and this fourth step here 
is to systemize your problem solving so that you have a system of uh, equations before you start actually trying to solve for a quantity. Because if you don't have at least as many equations as your unknowns, then you don't have enough information. What you really should be doing is reading the question more carefully and making sure you have all the information written down in a form of some kind of equation. So here, since I have that, then I can do it. Um, I'll use a substitution. So this equation is already solved for tension. So I'll plug that into equation one to eliminate tension. Then I get mg minus big MA is equal to small MA. And now I should be able to solve for acceleration by collecting the like terms. That gives me mg is equal to uh, MA plus big MA. And the reason I collect like terms is so that I can factor out that A from the like terms. Now I can solve for A by dividing through by M plus big A, big M. So acceleration is equal to mg divided by small m plus big M. So that's it. And this is what you did in the lab. This uh, uh, exam question just asks you for one more thing, tension. So let me do that. Uh, tension is equal to big mass M times this acceleration. So big mass m times the rest of the acceleration. Um, hopefully, I'm writing it relatively clearly, which m is capital M, which m is lowercase m. Um, so all right, that's, that's it. That's my answer. Any questions? No questions. So uh, your lab ended it here. And uh, that, that's pretty short exam question. So um, that's in why in parts C and D, uh, we are asking for some additional things. Let me uh, copy this over because I think uh, this will be useful to have. One second. At least the results will be useful to have. All right. Well, I guess I'm technically not copying, but. I'll have it off to the side so that I have it available as I'm answering these questions. Um, questions below relate to a change in the previous setup. Each change is independent of the other part. Uh, uh, C, describe how acceleration and tension change or do not change if the positions of the two masses are swapped. And I want you to illustrate a kind of mathematical or problem solving technique. So, uh, you can, it's definitely possible for you to resolve the entire question after having literally changed the positions of the two masses. Um, you can do that, nothing stops you from doing that. But uh, that does involve a lot of extra work that you don't need to do. What you can do instead is something you can do with just the analytical results here. So, what swapping the positions of the two masses really involves is swapping the labels, the small m, m, and big M, well, big M, swapping these two labels. Because when you imagine all the steps that I go through up here, if you just swap to, those two labels, small m and big M, that would uh, be effectively the same as physically swapping the positions of the, physically swapping the positions of the two masses, the big M and the small m. So, um, so what I'm actually gonna do is just take the result here and just uh, do this swap, algebraic swap of the labels and say my acceleration with the swapped masses is okay. So it's a big M times G divided by big M plus small M and all right. That looks different from what I have there. This is definitely not equal to small mg over small m plus big M. The, the change that matters being this m here. Um, so it, I hope it sort of makes sense that when it's the, um, that when it's the bigger mass hanging from the pulley, then they, they accelerate faster. Um, yeah, they accelerate faster. 
Now, what's uh, interesting is actually the tension. I don't know how many people will have expected this before going through the calculation, but when you write down the same thing for tension, for the tension in the string when they have been swapped is, well, uh, so it's a small m times big M G divided by big M plus a small m. And when you think through it, this is equal to the original tension. When you look at it, it's, you know, it just swaps the where the two m's are, but uh, since the multiplication, the order doesn't matter, it, nothing has changed. So these two expressions are in fact equal. And when you have those two masses, when you have those two masses swapped, then it doesn't, uh, tension is still the same. It's um, sort of, uh, I hope it's, well, for most people it's uh, unexpected how that works out. That, um, so I guess how it works out is, you know, so if you are holding the masses in place, then tension would have increased when the hanging mass thing was bigger. But because the acceleration is greater, um, that, means, um, that means for the mass that's hanging, um, the tension doesn't need to be as great as the weight of the thing hanging because it's now accelerating down faster. Um, so anyways, so, um, so as far as the explain your answer goes, you could be explaining your reasoning process for doing this algebraic thing. And you can also, you know, on the exam, you are on a clock, so I don't expect a whole long explanation. Because um, I'm pretty sure you can see that as I'm doing this bunch of explanation by saying things out loud, I'm actually going over time. Because during the actual exam, you should be doing these questions in about one every 20 minutes. So. Um, so, you know, on the exam, be efficient to with your time. <laughs> Let's uh, do question D. Uh, instead of being frictionless, uh, there's a coefficient of kinetic friction. It says, uh, find the acceleration of the two masses. Um, do I want to? Um, uh, let me start from scratch. I, I will copy over one thing, which is what I wasn't asking you to do anyway. That's the standard strategy. Because uh, the earlier part of the question kind of walked you through standard strategy. Uh, part D, because you've done it once already, expect you to just to do it on your own and not guide you through those steps again. But whether the question guides you through these steps or not, what you do doesn't change. You are still following the standard strategy. You are still doing the thing that makes sense for you to do when you're doing a force question. So, um, so with the new friction force there, what I would do is I would start out with, uh, I would start out with a free body diagram. Even when the question doesn't ask, ask me to, it still makes a sense for me to start out with a free body diagram. So let me draw a free body diagram of the small mass M and the big mass M. So on the small mass, nothing changes. There's a weight and tension. On the big mass is where now there are changes. So there will be weight and normal force and tension. And with the friction, you have to think carefully in what direction the mass is moving. So when the mass is moving to moving to left, then uh, friction force is to the right. So you want to make sure you have it going in the correct direction. So friction force going to right. Oh, forgot to label the normal force. All right. Uh, sorry, I think I wasted a whole lot of space there. So, all right, um, so with the free body diagram drawn, the next thing I need to do is I need to define the coordinate axis. That's the same axis as before, the direction of acceleration. I'm going to label that as being positive direction of acceleration. Uh, and I don't need to break any forces into components, thankfully. 
uh, now I can write down my uh, net force equation. So net force on the small mass m is going to be weight mg minus tension is equal to mass times acceleration, same as before. And I won't bother with the uh, x direction of forces since there aren't any net force on the big block. Now here, I actually do have to deal with the y and the x direction. Main thing being that with the friction force, I'm going to want to know the normal force. So if uh, for people who might have been ignoring normal force in part A earlier, this is where you do need to introduce normal force. So you have the force, let me say what in the y direction is the normal force minus the weight is equal to zero. And in the x direction, now it's a little bit more interesting. Instead of it being just a tension, it's a tension minus the friction force. That's equal to mass times acceleration. So here you have three, questions, three equations. And what I'm hoping you will notice is um, you have more than three unknowns. You have tension, acceleration, normal force, and friction. And this is where you have to remember. Um, so this is why I do the check. Uh, because if I started solving this system of equation while I had only three equations and four unknowns, I would have gotten stuck and all that time would have been basically wasted time. That's why it's uh, worthwhile for you to check, go through the check of do I have as many equations as unknowns so that you can realize that you need more information. Here, the information that you would have eventually figured out is that the friction force is related to normal force through this relationship. Friction force is coefficient times the normal force. So, um, so this is my equation four. And this allows me to um, allows me to get rid of one of the unknowns here. In fact, let me do that now. So this equation with the substitution of equation four becomes tension minus mu n is equal to ma. So let me call this equation 3a. Then, um, then uh, I, I guess uh, I should be systematic. So <laughs> now I have one, two, three equations with the three unknowns. So um, the way you want to be systematic, deliberate, organized in working through a system of equations is you want to eliminate one unknown at a time. And as you're eliminating them, you want to do it kind of thoroughly. And so here, uh, the decision I'm going to make now is to decide to eliminate normal force from my system of equations. The normal force occurs in two places. So I decide uh, which equation I'm going to use to solve for it and, which it, um, and use that as tool to eliminate it everywhere else. This equation is a little bit simpler. So I'm going to use this to choose to solve for normal force there. So normal force is mg. Uh, this is one of the simpler scenarios. Now I can use this to eliminate normal force everywhere. Uh, here I have only one equation where I need to eliminate, but if we were somehow in this other equation, then I would do it there too. So using that, this becomes now t minus mu mg is equal to ma. So, um, so this is my one equation and I have one more, well, one equation that I haven't used so far. So uh, considering this, and let me just copy that down here, mg minus t is equal to ma. Here now I have two equations and two unknowns similar to part A. So I'm going to do the same thing I did in part A. Uh, with a small difference being uh, neither of these are solved for tension, so I have to solve one of them for tension. Uh, I think before it was this equation that was already solved, solved for tension, but now I have to 
move the other term over so that I have mass times acceleration plus mu mg. I can plug that into the other remaining equation to get rid of tension and have only acceleration to solve for. So it's uh, mg minus big MA, again minus mu mg is equal to small m times acceleration, collect the like terms, and then solve for acceleration. When you go through all that algebra, uh, I hope I'm not skipping any step that'll confuse someone. Um, you end up with the acceleration is equal to mg minus mu mg. I'm writing down these two terms here and I'm dividing by what's going to be on the right hand side after I factor out a. So small m plus big m. So this is the new acceleration. And I think once you solve for it then, um, oops, sorry, this should have been, once you solve for it, it's kind of intuitive that um, it's very similar to the previous acceleration you had, except for the quote unquote net force is the weight on the small mass minus the friction on the big mass. Um, but it, like, you know, it's good to make sense of the, your answer and make sure it's, um, in, it makes intuitive sense as well as being correct uh, is um, algebraically. So, um, so this is the type of force problem solving that I'm hoping everyone will get very used to and that there's a kind of infinite variations you can do here. And once you master uh, application of this standard strategy, then um, all those different variations, what they'll do is you might have to spend more time, but hopefully you will ne never be stuck uh, trying to solve something.